Your brain is an amazing <laughs> organ. It's home to one of the most fascinating type of cells, neurons. Neurons form vast networks of connections which work together to control the human body and incredibly form consciousness. How does the brain form these networks and connections? Well, today I'm going to take you on a journey inside of a neuron and show you how one particular protein is involved in neuron function and development. This protein is called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's part of a family of proteins called neurotrophins or neurotrophic factors. Also included in this family is neurogrowth factor, or NGF, the first um, neurotrophin discovered in this family. BDNF is involved in many neurological functions, such as neuron development, neuron survival, and synaptic plasticity. So for BDNF to perform its functions, it must first be released at the synapse. And this is very similar to a neurotransmitter being released. It's released from a vesicle into the synaptic cleft. And as you can see, this is a postsynapse and a presynapse. And as the growth factor is released, it has to bind to a receptor. Now, BDNF can bind to two different types of receptors. First is the TREK B receptor, and the second is the P75 receptor. Now, upon binding, this produces very different effects on the nervous system, in which TREK B is responsible for neuron growth and survival and plasticity. However, the P75 receptor is involved in processes like apoptosis or programmed cell death. Now, you may ask, why would the nervous system want to kill off nerves or neurons? And that's because, for instance, during development, you begin with more neurons than you could ever need. And you must prune off the unwanted or unneeded neurons. Interestingly, the TREK B receptor is involved in survival of developmental neurons. So, for instance, as neurons are migrating, the ones that will reach their innervation points first will receive their TREK B um, innervation from BDNF, and they will survive. So you can kind of get an idea of how these different binding of these different receptors leads to very different effects on the nervous system. Now, I want to take a step back from molecular biology for a second, and I would like you all to sometime perform this exercise. Now, neurons are beautiful, and they have these incredible dendritic arborizations. And an arborization means a tree-like branch. So, especially in our northern climates, we have these trees without their leaves. And if you go into the woods, you can get an incredible representation of what it would be like to stand inside the brain. And little use of your imagination, and in this case, a help from Photoshop, I turned this tree into what I see underneath the microscope. And if you compare it to this image here, this is an, a Purkinje fiber located in the cerebellum, a structure on the back of your brain. And these neurons have some of the most robust dendritic arborizations. They're absolutely beautiful. Now, neurotrophins, for instance, are involved in the development of these arborizations and dendrites, specifically dendritic spines. So you can see from this image, these little spines that are coming off the dendrites are the location of synaptic formation, so the connections between neurons. That's where neurotransmitters are signaled and neurons can communicate. And BDNF is involved in the formation of the, these dendritic spines. They kind of resemble mushrooms. And what really is happening here is as a neuron fires and communicates, it will then release BDNF back and forth. And interestingly, BDNF can be transported either backwards from the postsynapse to the presynapse, called retrograde signaling, or anterograde, similar to a neurotransmitter, from the presynapse to the postsynapse. And really what's going on here is it's kind of like saying, hey bro, I received your signal, let's uh, hang out and uh, you know, continue to communicate and form a better relationship. And uh, 
as this happens, it strengthens these connections. And not only does it begin to strengthen just the synapse, it starts to form circuits and networks. And this is the foundation of learning and memory. So as you can see, BDNF is crucial to the development and function and maintenance of the nervous system. Now, you may have heard things like, exercise is good for the brain. Well, why is it good for the brain? I mean, it is good for a number of reasons, but for one reason is that it can upregulate and maintain levels of neurotrophins, such as BDNF. So therefore, it can enhance your ability to learn and have a healthy functioning nervous system. And this brings me to my next point. Because BDNF is so important to neural function in the healthy nervous system, it is also involved in disease pathology. So, in diseases like major depressive disorder, or just depression, stress is related to decreased neural activity and formation of synaptic connections. And therefore, antidepressants can help restore, you know, maybe BDNF levels. And there, this is the theory behind this, that exercise and antidepressants can help restore BDNF levels and therefore enhance neural activity and synaptic plasticity. In diseases like schizophrenia, there's also a correlation to abnormal expression levels of this protein, so either too much or too little. Now, I want to talk about one disease in, uh, specifically, and that's Huntington's disease. Huntington's is a movement disorder. It is an autosomal dominant disease that leads to the death of neurons in an area of the brain called the striatum. It's located in the basal ganglia, and it's involved in coordination of movement. Now, the Huntington protein itself is involved in an absolutely incredible um, cellular function called axonal transport. And what I didn't talk about earlier when I was uh, explaining how BDNF binds to its Trek B receptor, those signals are like a relay. And there's a passing of molecules down that leads to transcription of new genes. And for new genes to be made, that has to be activated by DNA located in the nucleus. And in neurons, that nucleus is, or cell body in soma, is located very far away from those synaptic terminals. So we have these amazing motor proteins called dynein and kinesin. And they literally walk along the lengths of the axon, carrying cargo. And as you can see in this illustration here, those are the vesicles, and the yellow um, proteins are the motor proteins. So as BDNF is bound to its receptor, it's endocytosed in these vesicles and trafficked all the way back to the nucleus. Now that Huntington protein is involved in these motor proteins. And it, in Huntington's, it is mutated and therefore it renders it dysfunctional, and axonal transport um, becomes aberrant. Therefore, these neurotrophic support signals are disrupted, leading to death in these neurons. Now this brings me to my research. So here at Northern Michigan University, our research lab, supervised by Dr. Eric Autumn, researches the relationship between muscle synthesized brain derived neurotrophic factor and its relationship to motor neurons. So, yes, BDNF is not only synthesized in neurons, it is also made in the muscle tissue. And we are trying to elucidate if there's an involvement between neurotrophic signaling, retrograde axonal transport, so the motor proteins carrying um, information from, or vesicles from uh, the dendrites back to the nucleus and diseases like spinal bulbar muscular atrophy and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. ALS is a motor neuron disease. It is the disease that Stephen Hawking, the famed uh, theoretical physicist who recently passed away, suffered from the majority of his life in his wheelchair. It is an absolutely debilitating disease, and we really do not understand this disease very well at all. There are no treatments that can prolong life at this point. And the interesting thing is 90% of it's spontaneous. So there are cellular mechanisms that are um, going wrong. And 
our research lab is trying to elucidate if this mechanism is involved. So before we go today, I want to share one message with you. And that's why I think having a greater understanding of neural function is very important. Now, aside from neuroscience, I have one other passion, and that's playing guitar. I'm an absolute guitar fanatic. And my advisor will tell you that I have a guitar problem. And I don't think it's a problem unless I'm trying to meet a, meet a deadline, like finish my thesis on time. <laughs> um, however, I do have a problem as a guitarist. And that's because I didn't learn music at a young age. And as I began to play guitar, I was bad. I was absolutely horrible. And I probably drove everybody nuts because I had no foundation of rhythm and timing or any understanding of melodic and harmonic relationships. And over the years as I got a little bit better, I suddenly realized to be a good or great guitar player, you first have to be a great musician. And in grad school, so around like five, six years ago, I was able to uh, take a few music courses, specifically sight singing and auditory training. And this is a course where you learn how to not only understand timing and rhythm, you sing sheet music, and you understand the foundations of harmony and melody, and pick up how to understand intervals of music. I didn't think I was going to be able to become very good at this, and it was really hard. It was honestly one of the hardest classes I ever took in grad school, even on top of these neuroscience and advanced molecular biology courses. It is incredibly hard to be able to hear different pitches of music and tell you the intervals, like a perfect fifth or a major third. And it was during this time where I was studying neuroscience. So I was studying these neurotrophins and how neural networks are formed. And finally, at one point, I realized that, oh my gosh, I'm making progress. I'm also understanding how the brain learns information, how it actually functions. And this information together helped me begin to make progress because I started to realize how I learned the best. And as students, you may have heard this before, you need to learn how you learn the best, and it is intuitive. However, it's also hard because sometimes it doesn't seem like you're making any progress. But if you understand how these networks are forming, how neural signaling works, and how synapses are strengthening and forming new networks, it can be extremely beneficial for your progress. And I look at it as you are expanding these neural networks, and it can take a long time and a lot of hard work, but eventually you're able to tap into them. And as you tap into them, in a way you're able to increase your perception of reality and your cognitive enhancement. I truly feel that a greater awareness and understanding of brain function can be a powerful tool to help you succeed at great things. Thank you.